Ghana is a country on the rise. Stable government, growing economy, and a traveler's dream. From incredible beaches to jungle canopy treks and epic wildlife. For us, Ghana also has a top caliber art scene with a young generation of artists tackling big issues, all done with an eye to their past and a focus on their future. A future arrived at on Ghanaian terms. I'm Ian Grant and I've spent the last three decades using my background in history and art history, exploring cultures all around the world. In this series, I'll take you to places I've never been to before. Experiencing local life through the lens of the world's artists, artisans, and keepers of culture. This is Culture Quest. Gustavus Adolphus College equips students to lead purposeful lives and act on the great challenges of our time. Gustavus, make your life count. Over a billion people live with preventable blindness. See International partners with volunteer doctors to provide sight-restoring surgeries in underserved communities around the world. This organization is united in one mission, to restore sight to the blind. They purify the air I breathe and the water I drink, keep me and the planet cool, and give me a career I love. Trees, when we take care of them, they take care of us. We all seek different in our own ways because different reflects who you are, who you want to be. The Northern Territory, different in every sense. So we just got into Elmina, and we're meeting up with my friend Nana Ofriata Aim, who started creating these mobile museums that now go all around Ghana, getting the art in front of the people. Elmina is home to the infamous Elmina Castle, a one-time stronghold for several colonial powers, and for centuries, a major port of the slave trade. Well before the slavers arrived, it was a centuries-old fishing village with a strong history of its own. This is where Nana is setting up the most recent edition of her mobile museum, a project that is reconnecting Ghanaians with their proud history. Hi. Nice to meet you in nice person. Nice to meet you. Hi. Yeah, how you doing? Good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Nana has a long list of accolades. She studied Russian for a year in St. Petersburg, worked at the British Museum. She's given TED Talks, written books, has had several fellowships and advisory positions at museums and universities all around the world. And she started this concept, the Mobile Museum. So I wanted to get beyond this narrow thing of pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post -colonial, that narrow kind of paradigm and yeah. time frame. You know, there's different contributions that different cultures make to the world. And so you have, you know, Western thought and Western philosophy, you have Eastern thought, Eastern philosophy, but because of like a small chapter in our history, what our contribution to the world is seen as not as valued, um, we didn't ourselves see as valuable. It's not just individually damaging to me as a human being of African descent to not know my own history. It's damaging to us as a collective. You know, it's damaging to us that we are not connected to our past, that we have this collective mentality that what comes from us in the past is wrong. You know, it's, it's us saying to ourselves that we're wrong and that other cultural values are more important and better than our own. I'm sure you've heard of the Golden Stool of the Ashanti, right? No. Okay, the Golden Stool of the Ashanti, for example, is the soul of the Ashanti people. When a person goes through the ritual of becoming king of the Ashanti, He's lowered three times over the stool and is transformed. He um, loses his name and he takes on a new name. Hmm. And he becomes not who he was before, but he becomes an incumbent of the stool. And the stool allows him to inhabit the spirit of every ruler that's come before him. When the British came, they knew that. And so they tried to steal the soul. They knew that if they had that stool, 
they're breaking the spirit of the people. So a lot of the time when these objects are taken and they are restored to like perfect condition, they're put into glass cases, they're put into temperature control controlled rooms. I'll give you a counter to that. When we do the Audria festival in my hometown, the Otihine will wear a cloth that's 400 years old, a Batakari, a war smock, the same war smock that you will see at the British Museum. Okay. The same war smock. We'll have the Atumpam drums, the same type of drum that you'll have in the British Museum. These objects are not dead. They're brought out and they are um, they're brought to life. I don't want to throw away the idea of a museum altogether because I think you know it has value as well. I love museums. Yeah. I love wandering the corridors of museums. Yeah. And so I, I was thinking, you know, rather than these kind of intimidating, pillared, um, you know, edifices that you think of when you think of a museum. What's a structure that could be democratic? What's a structure that could be egalitarian that people wouldn't be intimidated by? So I thought, why not a museum and a kiosk? You see a kiosk on every street corner. Um, kiosk is a hairdresser, it's a barber shop, it's a, um, everything. So one of the things of the mobile museum is also going into every region and asking people in the region, what is your cultural heritage? What has been passed down over time? What is of value to you? What are the histories that you want to pass on? And so that by the end of this tour that we're doing, we will have like, you know, this abstract kaleidoscopic um, portrait of the country. Right. Um, which is still just a beginning, you know, like it'll be hopefully full in its own way, but it will still be only a beginning. And now it's up to the capital city of Accra. This is Kwame Edu. He writes for the online magazine Culture Trip about all things Ghanaian, with a special focus on art and culture. He's also a published poet, has won awards in Europe for his children's books. He has a community library for the children in his neighborhood. He has a pop-up retail shop. And he is a hip-hop artist with three albums out. Much of the focus of his music is all about environmental and political issues. We get to hang out with him and his friend Drum Nation, one of the top sound engineers in Ghana. If you know High Life, it's, no, our, yeah. uh, it's our contemporary music, which is based on the polyrhythms of traditional music, oh, okay. which yeah, was gotcha. uh, popularized yeah. by E.T. Menza from the 1950s, mm -hmm. and then taken over by Ebo Menz, Taylor, and uh, Alaji K. Frimpong. Those whole uh, decades of amazing music. We pick from that music and then that whole radical approach, we sample mm -hmm. those records and then we, we put in some poetic approach to it or our, our inclinations to hip hop. I was actually in the and studio when he brought this folder full of highlight music and oh, yeah. he was like, yo bro, check this out. Uh -huh. Let's do something with this. I just take a song, mm -hmm. I drop it, I, I listen to it back for, back for, for like five times. Yeah. I pick the best parts and I just create a beat out of it. Under five minutes, right? Yes. Under five to ten minutes, the beat is done and he just hops behind the mic and, you know, and knocks it out. Yes. Did you really? In, yes. in one, one quick. Uh, yes. Just like <laughs> Both of you, you seem to have enough that combination of confidence and self-criticalness. So you're not you're not satis you're not satisfied, so you keep you keep pushing, pushing, keep pushing, yeah. but you're confident in, in the idea that you can get there, right? True. Because you, you need both. both. Yeah. To yeah. me, the idea of uh, getting there is uh, actually uh, sometimes it's 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 upside down. There's something called sankofa, which which means go back and take. Like that whole idea of we need to live here and then be big somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's actually sometimes backwards. That whole idea of getting to the top may be a westernized approach on success. But go back and take is knowing yourself 
that whole thing with identity when you know yourself and then you realize that we didn't come from poverty but poverty is a whole idea which was sold to us then you realize that you are already rich but our destination may not be the westernized approach of development but it could be the african and a return to their roots. I love that. That, that to me is a really <laughs> important point. Thank you. Because because we get around, uh, we've gotten around to a lot of a lot of different countries, yeah. and a lot of colonial, just a lot of a lot of places with struggle. Yes. And it and a lot of it revolves around identity, mm -hmm. and 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 people trying to figure out their own identity instead of the one that's been presented, presented to, them by to them us by the United States or by mm -hmm. you know Europe by colonial powers. So it. it it's good to be get it. It's good to be in that frame of mind. Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you a lot. Yeah. All right. And who cares if I like it? Who cares? Yeah, exactly. Who cares if yeah. Ian likes it or yeah. not? You know all the uh, besides yourself, a, a few of the other artists that are, they're all all of you guys are involved with using recycled, reclaimed, yes. repurposed yeah. stuff, which I'm still. I mean, it's such a such a method here. We use it in our art to speak to our pain, to speak to our uh, uh, dilapidation, to speak to our decay. Yeah. But also it turns out to be something beautiful. There's one track of mine where I'm speaking to plastic waste and you can see me submerged in a whole river of plastic. Like just being swallowed up in all this chunk. So it's a global issue. It's not just Ghana. But then in our own small way, to speak about it, because we know how the internet also works, to carry the message across. We know our art may not change the world, but it may change individuals or impart some knowledge into individuals to look at waste differently. Kwame takes us to the fishing village of Jamestown, tucked below the ocean bluffs of Accra, to experience firsthand the effect waste is having on traditional life here. And you see all the plastic and stuff just embedded into the ground and the sand. And this is so much of what the artists that we're meeting with are, are talking about and using in their art. We're heading out to ocean on one of these traditional Ghanaian boats, getting a taste of this local hard, hard lifestyle. A lifestyle that's kind of under threat with overfishing and climate change and you can see plastic bags floating around in the water all over the place. So they put the net out, made the full circle and now they're tightening it up to bring in all the fish that are trapped in the middle. And then they haul it all up back onto the boat. It's a hell of a lot of work. didn't realize they got some of this stuff going on. Hands get wet and it's uh, hemp rope and it's just first time doing this, just sliced open my fingers. But you gotta keep going, right? You gotta get in the fishing net. <laughs> And of course, the issue of waste doesn't stop at the shore. Like right here, you can see we are catching yeah. black polythene bags and all that. So you realize there's, even away from the shore, there's this same problem of plastic waste that is threatening. But in the face of dwindling fish and pollution, and they yes. still come out with hope to catch. With hope to catch a handful of fish. Yeah. I
This is Nana Anoff, and he's a self-taught welder and sculptor. All of his work is made out of salvaged materials, the medium itself becoming the overarching message in all of his pieces, addressing the problems of waste. He has exhibited all around the world and has won awards for his work, tackling the issues of social justice, labor, and women's rights. Where do you find stuff? Do you go to like junkyards? Or yes, whatever? I go to junkyards and now, um, most, we have, Accra has a very vibrant, um, metal and aluminum collecting. Oh, it um, does? Yes. The young guys on trolleys, you see them pull them. Oh. So they beat me to it. So I have a few ag <laughs> arrangements with some of them. When they find something interesting, yeah. they, they, they bring it to me and then I can give them, either we do butter, I give them something in weight or yeah. I pay them for it. Yeah. yeah. The fish, I call it breaking free. And uh, water forms like 70% of the earth. Yeah. And so what you are doing to the ocean, it's, you kill 70, you've killed yourself. So, you know, we just came from... The sea. Which is why I'm wet with, from yeah. here down. So we were out with, with these fishermen mm -hmm. on their boat and putting out the line. And you're catching and plastic bags. We're catching plastic. Yeah. But yet they still go out and fish. They have no choice. Yeah. Well, sorry. We, we, <laughs> I, I sidetracked us. But this, stay on because I, yeah. this is awesome. I love the typewriter. So, yeah. Uh, all these different elements. Uh, and most of the time I like... You know, when I have that throw to show freedom. And the elephant? I call the matriarch. Most of my work is to highlight the African woman. They have little, but they are able to um, achieve much. So I was thinking that elephants trust the women. And so they are trusted with the history, the trails, where the water in severe droughts, where which water holes are, right. are going to be will produce water. They lead the park and they, they sustain the park. So I was thinking that most probably, you know, the women in Africa do all the work. We should trust our mothers who, to, to take up the reins of governance. That's, so, that's my political piece, which yeah. the men are not going to be happy with. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> so anyway. So this is a sad story of some of the women in some of our prison cells with the most flimsy of injustice, and I've been thrown away when the keys have been locked. So I call- Oh, like they get, get thrown in jail yes, and that's the end. Yes, yes. So I call this the condemned cell. Oh. People with potential, people with, um, with a whole lot to give, mm -hmm. but they've been locked up- They get and, locked in here. And keys thrown away. This is something that will bring you joy. Play oh, some yeah. music. It is a little Bob Marley, yeah. yes, all right. <laughs> so somebody on a, on a string instrument playing yeah. music. How long you been doing this? Maybe 12, 13 years, but I've been as an artist for like, like 20 years. What you do before sculpt? Um, oh, you I was, were a painter? Yeah, watercolor painting, like seven, eight years, yeah. I wanted a sign for people to come in and I couldn't afford, so I said, let me make one. And back then, oh, they, the, the, like the, the sign that we saw across the street. That's yes. one of your sculptures. Yes. Yeah. And then afterwards, a few people came in and then walked right out. They said, we came in to see sculptures, not paintings. So after three or four people had walked out, I said, wait a second. Oh, I, I need to, I need to start doing something or change my sign. Yeah. <laughs> this is Serge Atukwai Klati. He started out as a painter like his father, but followed his instincts and quickly branched off into several different directions. Painting, performance art, and what he's best known for, using old plastic jerry cans and turning them into brightly colored tapestries. Much of his work focuses on migration and the effect it has on people as seen through objects, exploring the different roles an object takes on throughout a lifetime. Let me see. Hello. Nice to meet you. First nice to meet you. Welcome. How do I get over to you? Can I walk? Yeah, feel free to You're walk. Walking on your arts? It's easy, you know. I know it's easy. Man. Yeah. The walking part isn't the problem. It feels it, wrong, man. Yeah, it's part of the process. So. It's nice yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet really, you. Man. Yeah, good yeah, to meet you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, pleasure. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. This is the studio space and it's actually a family compound. It's a family it's a, compound? Yeah, it's a family compound that I use as a studio 
space, uh, you know. Okay. So I moved here a couple of years ago because my dad lived here, my grandfather also lived here. So it's like a generational line where, gotcha. you know, every generation got to experience the space. And for me, it's very critical to my practice as an artist. And all these were influenced by Europeans settling on the coast, you know, the influence of power, of um, exchange, trade, were influenced by Europeans on the coast. Through this process as an artist, you know, looking at environment as well as the political system of how objects change and form and value after it's been displaced. You right. Know? Yeah. 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 Well, which ends up being, uh, I mean, that's right at the heart of what I'm finding this episode is, is all about. What happens to the discarded thing? Exactly. And how does it get reinvented instead of just left? Right. This particular pattern is reference to the fishing nets because um, fishing is part of our our tradition as as a Ga yeah. tribe um, together with the um, my assistants you know we are interested in expanding this narrative through the patterns in which we create so we scout for objects we look around we travel around and we have people that we trade with you know so people bring broken gallons and we buy it from them you know so that also helped the community yeah. People use them for chairs, people use them for for beds, you know, put them together and lie on them, you know. It's, oh, you yeah. do mean that? So yeah, they, yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll like collect a bunch of them just to make a platform or something? Yeah, yeah. You know, one, gotcha. you can also sit on one when, you, you know, some homes when you have, they have visitors, you just offer them a gallon, you know, and they oh, sit really? on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting how yeah. people relate to that object. Where are the jerry cans made? They come from different parts of the world. Really? Originally, they were used to transport cooking oil. They come from Europe filled, and then they go out into various yeah. areas around the country and exactly. get used for all these other things. Right, yeah. And then find their way into for, your hands. In, yeah, in my hands. And yeah. then I manipulate a little bit, you know. A yeah. little bit. A yeah. little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. There's another big element to this art. And it's the labor, the hands, the work that's going into it. If you look at this, I mean, it's, it's boiling hot here. I'm soaked and I'm just standing here talking to a camera. They're working in this day in, day out, working with an angle grinder. Stuff's flying in your face and sticking in your sweat. And then they're tying, you know, this copper wire, piece by piece, twine it all together. And it's the whole community. They're all from this little La neighborhood. So they get their hands in this. They're part of major pieces of art that then go out and are in installations all around the world. And with this work, I give them the freedom to express. That was my next question. Yeah. So they, it's, exactly. it's these guys that get to choose, hey, yeah. I'm going to use this side instead of the other side. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's more like a collaboration, you know, with my guys, you know, and not just doing exactly what I want, but also, you know, they've spent time with the work, they understand the materials, and then, so I allow them to also express themselves. Uh, everyone you know, has their own you know, kind of thumbprint. Yeah, so I have like different hands working on one piece, so yeah. it's just, you know, the patterns, the technique varies, you know, yeah. yeah. I love that idea of it being made by the community yeah. and being able to be appreciated by the community. Right, absolutely. And, and we do a lot of public installation you do. Um, around the community. Mm -hmm. We install the work on buildings and all that because uh, we want the work to be more visible to the people in the community because they, they are part of the process. So yeah. whenever I have a show abroad, I try as much as possible to install the work outside for a couple of days, a couple of hours where kids um, people come by to visit, take photos and all that, you know, so they become part of the work. And his work is getting out all around the world, from Asia to Europe to the United States. He has a piece in the in the Facebook uh, headquarters, headquarters, right? A yeah. huge piece hanging on, yeah. on like a big uh, atrium wall or something. Yeah, like three stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, to me, it seems like a it big is, deal. It is, it is. We head over to a little bar that Serge owns with a few of his friends to continue our discussion. I always think of art as, you know, having its first two main layers is, the first one is, is its visual impact, right? right? I mean, you've got to look at it and find it interesting. Yeah. But then the second one is the, the message or what, what exactly. it's trying to inspire. Right, yeah. And you, at least to us, and it, uh, clearly to a lot of other people, that you have both, right? Yeah. It's yeah. visually interesting 
and then it has that message with it. But frankly, your your art has a whole bunch of layers beneath that. But there are struggles that come with being an artist at Serge's level, and that gets uh, us right back artists, to identity. You know, African artists, African art, you know, all these things really box African arts in a different way. You yeah. know, art is supposed to be global, and the fact that artists come from Africa doesn't make that whatever the artists create is African art, you know? Yeah. A residency at Rice University's Moody Center for the Performing Arts in Texas help push his work onto that global stage, bringing his ideas of migration to the United States, a country with its own struggles in that area. It also moved him into working in a completely new medium. My residency with the Rice University gave me a very strong, decisive idea about migration. For me, the chairs represent power. And the boards they are broken, they represent unstable power. So every chair has a character of history and power. And then I use shoes as well because shoes, to be able to experience someone's life, you have, you have to step in the person's shoes. You know, so I use shoes as a symbol of migration. I did a collaboration with some students from the Rise. They were dressed in a very nice, fancy clothes with a glass of wine. The students? A student, yeah. yeah. So they were also within the space, you know, right. walking around. But I was just cleaning, you know, I was just suspenders. Oh. Yeah, okay. and the mob, mm -hmm. cleaning and sweating. I was trying to create a conversation about how migrants contribute a lot to all those destinations. Yeah, so for me, it's one of the, like, the major performances that I find it very important because, um, you know, my first time actually installing such work, I think that it was good. Growing up, I thought art was just fun, you know, I paint and, but I realized that it's more of a responsibility. I have so much to do, so much to talk about. Yeah. How do I execute that visually for people to understand? Yeah. That is my hustle as an artist, is to be able to, to make people understand. Art for me is very hunting. I think about art 24 hours, even in my sleep, with friends, hang out with friends, I'm still thinking. Still thinking about art. Yeah, I'm anywhere. You can't I'm still shut thinking. that thing no. off. Yeah. No, it's, it's an, so sometimes it scares me, you know, but I believe that it's, it's just what it is. I can't, no. I can't, I can't stop it. Yeah, how are you yeah. going to stop the river, right? Right, yeah. yeah. Is it exciting? I mean, it's, yeah. I know it's a lot of work, but it's... It's exciting, but it's also scary, you know, but I think that, um, I just have to be focused as much as I can yeah. and make sure I don't get carried away by, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I have to be myself. Art has to have some sort of visceral effect on the viewer. Without that initial hook, they just walk on by, stop listening, stop watching. But what's also important to most artists is what are you going to do with that person's attention once you've drawn them in? The artists here in Ghana take full advantage of that rare moment in time when they have the viewer's undivided attention on their work, tackling big issues, issues that not only affect Ghana, but people around the world. Gustavus Adolphus College equips students to lead purposeful lives and act on the great challenges of our time. Gustavus, make your life count. Over a billion people live with preventable blindness. See International partners with volunteer doctors to provide sight-restoring surgeries in underserved communities around the world. This organization is united in one mission, to restore sight to the blind. They purify the air I breathe and the water I drink, keep me and the planet cool, and give me a career I love. Trees, when we take care of them, they take care of us. We all seek different in our own ways because different reflects who you are, who you want to be. The Northern Territory, different in every sense.